Thank you for listening to Liberty Christian Center's podcast. Let's join Pastor Paul Carlson for today's message. Really, where we're at today is, is we're the third week of a series we've been doing, and we've called this series Fearless. Okay? Why do we call it Fearless? Because that is, you know, God's heart. That is God's desire. His plan for each one of His children is that you and I would walk through life fearless. Does that mean we're never going to have an opportunity to fear? No. But it means when those opportunities come, we know enough to draw into His presence, to put our eyes on Jesus, and He is so good He lifts us out of that place of fear and causes us to be fearless. Fear is really, you know, being controlled by a demonic force. Really, you know, getting right down to it. Fear, wow, thanks, Pastor. I come to church today and you're telling me I'm, yeah. Well, can I just be real? Can I just be real? I've, I've been under that kind of thing before. You know, if you were here in the beginning, I told a, a big story the first day, I think, about, you know, a time when Dane and I were just gripped with fear, and it went on for months, and it caused us to live on a lower level of life than really we wanted to and lower level of life than God wanted us to. And, and God was so faithful to us and showed us how to walk out of it, and that's how he, that's how he rolls. He shows us how to get out of these things when they surround us in life. Now, the psalmist in Psalm 34, I love this scripture. It says this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Then in verse 4, it says, I sought the Lord And he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Wow. This is like a personal glimpse into this psalmist's life. He's he's a person. The person writing this is a person just like you and me. He's a person just like you and me that has feelings and emotions, that has life circumstances staring him in the face. And he says, I have found a secret He said, I found a place that I can go. I can get into the presence of God. I can magnify Him. I can can have my soul make its boast in Him. What does that mean? It means, he says, I can bring my mind and my will and my emotions to attention and say, Lord, you you are great. You are great. You are awesome. You're the most high God. And when I get in that place, the psalmist says this. He says, says, I'm giving the glory to God. I'm seeing who he is. I'm declaring who he is. And he says, there's something about it that just makes me fearless. He's delivered me from all my fears, is what he said. So, you know, one thing about dealing with fear is this, is, is getting the perception, getting the idea, getting this truth ingrained in us that there is no God like our God. There's no God like our God. Whatever you might be fearing today, there's no God like our God. No one. I'm telling you what, nothing that we face on this earth measures up to who He is. And, 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 you know, it is no big thing for God to just show His power and miraculously turn around the events in our life. Wow. He's so good. He's so cool. So in Isaiah 40, I've got a few scriptures. In Isaiah 43, uh, 10, he says this. He says, you're my witnesses, saith the Lord. And my servant whom I've chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there is no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there's no Savior. So again, declaring this, there's no God like our God. There could be other gods out there that people worship, but there's no God like our God. There's none. Then in Exodus chapter 18, verse 10, we've got a story here or a statement here from this guy named Jethro. Do you know who Jethro was? 
Jethro was Moses' father-in-law, okay? Not to be confused with Jethro Bodine, who was Jed Clampett's nephew. But, but Jethro, in this story, was Moses' father-in-law. And, and Jethro watched from the sidelines and saw the hand of God on, on Moses as he went in to approach Pharaoh. And, and he saw, you know, the, 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 the mighty king, the Pharaoh of Egypt, he saw him buckle to the power of God and release the children of Israel. Jethro says, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the, hands of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of, of Pharaoh and who has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. He said in verse 11, he says, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. For in the very thing in which he beh- they behave proudly, he was above them all. So what's he saying? You see, the Egyptians, they, they had a lot of clout in the earth. In fact, in that day, if you'd have had the internet going, and you were someone who watched the internet every day, you'd have been convinced there is no way that Pharaoh would bow to the man Moses. You'd have thought, my goodness, there's no way that the powers of Egypt would release the slaves from bondage. You'd have thought that. But Jethro, he says this, I've seen this in the very thing that they were proud about. There's no God like our God. No God like our God. Can I tell you something? God is not just the opposite of the devil. You know? You know what I'm saying? God is not just the opposite of the devil. See, because that's how it is in some people's mind. They think the forces of good and the forces of evil, and they're in this tug of war, and we're on the sidelines, and we're wondering who's going to win. Have you ever been in a tug of war? You know, you better wear the right shoes, you know, and and you better have a grip. You better know when the whistle blows or you're going to be flying into the mud, okay? But some people look at, you know, at life, they look at history and they think, well, good versus evil, God versus the devil, who's going to win? Let me tell you, folks, there's no God like our God. There's no, it's, it's not a power struggle, I'm telling you what, when God exerts his strength, the devil runs, okay? Fear cannot control us. God's will, man, is that we walk through life fearless. In 1 John 4, in verse 4, one of my favorites, and I usually read it out of the King James, the old King James, he says it like this, he says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Can I say something? That would be good information to hold on to in the day that you and I are living right now. Did you hear me? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Greater is, do you know that that does not need to be rewritten as time goes on? That does not need to be rewritten if you're in another country, you know, under another political system. Greater is he that's in you and me than he that's in the world. Wow. That's like mind-blowing in a good way. That's like strength to stand on in the day that we live. There's no God like our God. We don't need to fear because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. Praise the Lord. Well, let me talk about, go back to Genesis, will you? You know, I know, I, I'm a Genesis, go back to Genesis kind of guy. And, and uh, people wondered, how long will it take before he goes back to the garden? Hey, well, Genesis chapter 3. You know, the story here in, in the first couple chapters of Genesis, it's, it's so tremendous. I love to just read through it and, and just think about it and, you know, imagine and, you know, and, and just see what God's, you know, doing here. But basically, it, it kind of goes like this, is that here's God, the most high God, the creator of everything. He has a desire. And, and this desire is for a family. Truthfully, his desire is for you and me. And, and so, so God creates a man and puts him in this garden. One, one translation calls it a, a paradise of pleasure. 
You know, he, he puts man in this place of perfection and, and as a home for the man. He, he creates a woman for this man. And he says, now be fruitful and multiply and replenish this earth. Bring my family into existence. And, and so, you know, Adam and Eve, they had it made, so to speak. They, they walked with, with God in the cool of the day and they, they hung out with him and, and, and had God talks and, and God adventures. And, 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 you know, it was, I'm sure, not boring in any way. I'm sure it was magnificent. But there, there came a time in Genesis 3, 3 rolls around where man had a choice. Can you say choice? You know, God didn't make man in such a fashion that he was a robot. He didn't say, well, you're going to serve me no matter what. He says, no, you have a choice. He, put, he had this tree in the garden. He says, no, don't eat of this tree, you know. And, and he didn't put up, you know, armed guards around it and say, hey, don't you dare. You know, he says, don't do it. And he gave man a choice. Just like in this, in life with you and I, we have a choice, you know, sometimes people have all kinds of bad things coming on their life. And granted, we, lead, we live in a world where it's demonic. There's things out there. There's forces out there that are not good. But sometimes people make choices that aren't good, and it puts themselves in a bad position. Wow, ow, wow, pastor, you're supposed to encourage me. Well, I'm just, just going here, and we'll, we'll get to encouragement too, okay? Um, yeah. So then in Genesis 3, verse, verse 7, what you need to know about Genesis 3, verse 7, is it comes after Genesis 3, verse 6. And, and what happened here is that the fall happened, and, and everything changed. Have you ever heard people talk about that? Everything changed. This changes everything. Well, truly, back in Genesis chapter 3, between verses 6 and 7, everything changed. Because Adam and Eve partook of the fruit that, that they weren't supposed to. And they went through this radical change. And, and on the inside, it says that, that they lost the life that they had and they gained the death that the devil had. They, they gained a new substance. They actually became the reverse born-again people. Instead of becoming new creatures in Christ, they became old creatures. Not in Christ. Something. Okay, so, so, you know, then, you know, they're used to, this is what I get to, is Adam and Eve were used to expressing what was on the inside of them. So, as Genesis 3, 7 rolls around, that part didn't change. They still expressed it. It says this, it says, the eyes of them both were open, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, God amongst the trees in the garden. And the Lord God called on to Adam and said, where art thou? Adam, Adam, where art thou? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So what I'm presenting to you this morning is that up until this time in history, there's no record of fear having a grip on man. You don't see that in Genesis 1 and 2. And I know there's limited information, but the very first time that I see that fear gripped man is here in Genesis 3.10 when they heard the voice of God and they heard him walking in the garden and they were afraid and they hid themselves. Let me tell you something. Even when you and I blow it, I love this part of it too. When you and I have done our worst, God still comes looking for us and he still knows our name and calls our name. Wow. You know, <laughs> you, can, you can hide behind any kind of tree and whatever, but God is coming looking for you. And he'll, 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 he'll do his best to pull you in. Tell you what, man, I remember times in my life where I ran from people that, you know, exuded too much God in their life because they, they brought a fear into me that I'd have to change, you know? We had a, a friend of our family. His name was Carl, Carl Petty. He's in heaven now. But, I mean, this guy was about, he was like an embodiment of what I'd imagined Smith Wigglesworth to be like, the man. And, and he'd, uh, he'd, walk, he'd walk into, you know, he was at every meeting you could imagine, and Carl was always the loudest amen. And, and uh, you know, he knew every preacher. He told me once, 
We were at a camp meeting one time, and I ran into Carl, which was a common event. I'd run into him in places all the time. And, and uh, we were, John Osteen was going to preach. You guys heard of him? He's Joel's dad. And, and he says, oh, yeah, I've had John and Dodie to my house for dinner before. I said, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, we, we go way back. You know, he knew everybody. But I remember he'd come over to our house, and he'd come in. He'd always go, well, glory. That was like his line. He just said that. When I heard that, man, I would run for the hills. I'd run. I'd go, for my, go to my bedroom and hide from that guy because he, he bothered me. He scared me. He scared me. Even though he was a nice guy, he scared me because he represented change in my life that I'd have to make because I hadn't received Jesus and I didn't understand. And somehow he would always find me, though. Carl would not be stopped by a shut door. He'd come down the basement. He'd find my room. He'd knock, Paul, you in there? Boy, yeah, yeah, come on in. You know, he'd come in and he'd never judge me, but he'd walk around and you know and look at stuff I had and and uh, it's like, oh, Carl, oh, I'd be just so glad when he'd leave. Like, wow. But in any case, fear it came in at the fall of man. Hebrews two fourteen. If you will, just look at that. Hebrews two fourteen. It says here, inasmuch, inasmuch then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. Now, now, I don't care how old you are, this is talking about us, okay? We're referred to here as the children. As the children are partakers of flesh and blood, basically, we just, we've got bodies. He says, so he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. What's it saying here? Well, one thing it's saying is this, that the whole human race was subject to fear. And one of the things that Jesus did when he came to this earth, he took a body and then he lived his life. He died on the cross for you and I in our place as our substitute, and he destroyed the grip that the devil had on us, okay? That's what Jesus did. Say, thank God for Jesus. He made the way that you and I could walk free from fear. He broke the power of fear. I'm telling you what, he made it of readily available to us today. So fear, again, just talking about fear, fear is designed to keep you and I from walking in the plan that God has for us, okay? Fear is designed to hold us back, to keep us from, from rising up in the plan that God has for us. Turn to Matthew 14. Are you with me today? Hallelujah. Oh, is he talking about fear again? Well, you know what? We're living in a day where people are fearing. And you know, as, as part of the body of Christ and, and, and people here at Liberty Christian Center, I want to present the word to us in a way that we can see, hey, there is an option. We don't have to be sucked in with the world. We can live our lives on a high place. We can walk with God in the high places of this earth. We may not be in the Garden of Eden, we may be living in a fallen earth. I'll tell you what, we, there's a day coming. But that day is right now, too, where we can walk with God. We can walk with Him. This isn't just talking about when we get to heaven. Heaven is great. No, no diss on heaven. That's good. We're going to be there someday. But I'm telling you what, what I'm talking about is what's available right here on the earth. Okay? Matthew 14, verse 22. Just a quick example, again, of how fear gets in people and keeps them from rising up in life. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. And while he sent the multitudes away, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by waves, and the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. Now that's different, you know. Most people, 
probably take a boat or a jet ski or something. Jesus, he just walks on the water to go to them. And his disciples saw him walking on the sea, and they were troubled. And, you know, I, I don't want to knock the disciples because if I was in a boat in the middle of the sea and I saw somebody walking on the water, it may trouble me too. Okay? And they thought it was a ghost. Interesting. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Be of good cheer, it's I. Do not be afraid. And what I want to tell you right now is that is the message of heaven. That's the message of heaven to you and I. Time and time again when, when angelic you know, beings would come and encounter, you know, men would encounter them, you know, and fear would try to grip them. That's the first thing they'd say is fear not. Here Jesus is, and they think he's a ghost walking on the water, and he says, hey, it's I, be of good cheer, don't be afraid. Be released from fear. Peter answered to him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. You know, in, in, in my thinking... I'm glad it was Peter that walked on the water, you know? Because Peter, you know, I mean, what we see of Peter, I mean, he was kind of the goof off, okay? Had it been John, the one who Jesus, you know, loved, in John's mind, Jesus loved him more than anybody, really, Jesus loved everybody the same. But John, I mean, he was a pretty cool guy. He was there, one of the big three, but you rarely see him goof up. And he was really the only disciple there when Jesus died on the cross because he had such a revelation of God's love for him. But here we got Peter. Peter jumps out of the boat at the word of Jesus. I like that. I like that. Peter did it. We could do it. He says, um, come. And Peter, when he had got down on, on the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Verse 30 is very important. It says, but when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and he began to sink. And he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him up, and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So first we see this. Peter took his eyes off Jesus put them on the winds and the waves. And as he did that, one, he began to fear. Two, he began to sink. When Jesus lifts him up, he says, Oh, Peter. How did he say it here? He says, Oh, you of little faith. One thing fear will do in your life is it will minimize your faith. Fear will come and, and knock on your door and one of the things it does, if you let them in, is it will minimize your faith. How did it happen for Peter? Well, Peter began to sink. He began to sink. And then he cried out to the Lord. The Lord graciously, mercifully lifts him up. You know, and I see they walked on the water the rest of the way, get in the boat, and, and the wind ceased. And those that were in the boat came and worshiped and said, truly, you're the Son of God. So one thing when fear comes is we need to be mindful to put our eyes on Jesus. Put our eyes on him. Get him off the circumstance. Look to Jesus. Praise the Lord. You know, there's different types of fear. We've talked about this a little bit that, you know, there's, if you Google this, I mean, there are so many different kinds of fear phobias that are in the world. People are afraid of small places. People are afraid of high places, low places. People are afraid of success. People are afraid of failure. People are afraid of, you know, the dog next door, and, and it goes on and on. But one of the fears that I find that, that it probably is really common to most people is, is summed up in this word that I'm going to say it's called cares. Do you hear me? I won't even ask because if I asked, everyone in here would probably raise their hand and say, I've been confronted and I've been controlled before by cares. What are cares? Cares are the kind of thoughts that come into our mind that immobilize us, and it's really fear about the future. One person said this, talking about fear. They said that fear is actually estimating the future without God in the equation. Huh, isn't that something? You think about it. Fear is, is really based on future events that haven't happened, and fear is us thinking about those events and, and not putting Jesus anywhere in the picture. 
Wow. Anyway, so, you know, as, as thoughts of the future come into our mind, we need to be diligent to go, there's Jesus. I see him in my life. I see him making the way. I see him lifting me up when I'm starting to sink, and I see us walking on the water together to the boat. But in 1 Peter chapter 5, in verse 6, it, it addresses this whole topic of care, this whole arena of fear called cares. And, and in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, it says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. I, I like that. Humble us. You know, that's not always an easy thing to do because, you know, pride is like this. Pride says, I can do this thing on my own. Bless God, I don't need nobody. Nothing. Yeah. But humility receives help. Humility receives the hand of God on our life. So he says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Then in verse 7, he says, casting all your care upon him. Why is that? Because he cares for you. I love that part of it. See, the reason that, that, that we can so freely cast our cares on him is because we know this, that he cares about us. Did you know he cares about you today? In, uh, I'm going to read a couple different translations here. The, the New Living uh, Testament says, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Message Bible says, Live carefree before God, for he is most careful with you. I like that. Amplified says, Casting the whole of your care, all of your anxieties, all of your worries, all uh, of your concerns, once and for all on him, for he cares about you f affectionately and cares about you watchfully. That's, that's a good one. The Living Bible is another one. I'll read this one. It says, let him have all of your worries and cares, for he's always thinking about you and watching everything that concerns you. Wow. That's what God's doing. He's, he's got his eye on us. He's looking out for us. He cares about us, so therefore, I can cast my cares on him. I can give him, I can trust him with my future, with my life. The devil will come, and this is one of the devil's favorite lines. He'll come and he'll say to you, what are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? And God says this, he says, I care about you, so just don't worry about the future. Cast your cares on me. Can I tell you about a time in my life that was probably one of the most depressing, oppressing, uh, filled lot times in my life I can remember? You want to hear about that? This just sounds dark. I mean, goodness, I'm going to just bum you all out. But it has a good ending. But, but it was when, when Dana and I first got married. Now, that's terrible to say that. One of the, the <laughs> terrible, most depressing, oppressing times. And then I go, and it, when Dana and I first got married. No. Let me go on a little more and say this, that, that you know, we, we lived in Haiti the first, you know, six months that, that we were married. I had lived there before that, and I brought her down there, and we went through a bunch of wild things down there, but we, in my heart, I knew we were coming back to the States. I didn't know the timing, but it ended up being about six months after Dana and I got married. So we, we moved back to the States, and, and you know, when I look at it logically, it should have been just a yippy skippy time of life, you know? Got my new, my wife, you know, my babe, you know, we're living life in America, yeah, you know, it's like going to Disneyland or something, living in America. And, 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 and yet, for me, I was just totally overwhelmed with care. And, and if you'd have seen me, I functioned normally in the world, but behind the veil, I was filled with care, which tells me this. You never know what people are going through when you see them in life. So it's always good to be nice to people when you can, you know, because you don't know what they're going through. But at, when we moved back, you know, we, we, we didn't have anything. Everything I owned was fit into my suitcase that I brought on the plane to come home. You know, we, we left everything in Haiti. We left furniture. We left vehicle and, and, you know, things. We just left them there because, you know, goodness, it's just easier than trying to deal. And it's good to bless people. So we bless some missionaries and stuff. But we came back to the States, and these thoughts were bombarding my mind in what are you going to do now? 
what are you going to do now? And people, well-meaning Christians, will come up to you. You're in church. What are you going to do now? What are you going to do now? It, it was like I didn't even want to go to church. And, and, and we did go to church, you know, because when we were in Haiti, you know, there were different churches that supported us and individuals too. And, 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 and there was one church in particular that was in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. It happened to be an Assembly of God church, and they'd been faithful supporters to us. And really, as I prayed about it, I saw myself just, just helping them any way I could. So I came, and, you know, they didn't hire us on staff or anything, but, I, you know, we came and said, hey, listen, we're here. We'll do anything that we, we can to help. So before I knew it, I was the associate pastor in charge of youth, I was like, the youth pastor, I was like, wow. And that, that blew my mind, too, because, you know, I had no training in that. I, 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 I didn't even have the book of games, you know, of what to play and stuff like that. And, you know, and they kind of overwhelmed me, and, 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 and life overwhelmed me. I had been a single guy, and, and I had figured that out. And, and, you know, I didn't have, you know, so to speak, a care in the world. I could go do what I wanted to do, but now I was married, and this was the care that was coming at me, is now I, I, I need to provide for my wife. Ouch. Ouch. It was just driving me down. I remember one night in particular that Dana and I were, uh, we actually walked to church. It was a Sunday evening. They had Sunday night services. And we walked to church. It was, it was a ways, but it was like two or three miles. But, but you know, we're used to walking. We lived in Haiti. So what you did for fun in Haiti is go for a good walk. And, and so we were walking to church, and, and I began to just, you know, unveil to Dana how I felt. And for me, that's a big thing, because, you know, I don't, like, just readily just share things like that with anybody. And at that time, with Dana, now I, I'm better at it. But I told her how I felt, and, and all the way to church, you know, I talked about all the cares I had. And by the time I got to church, man, I was feeling really low. And the strange thing is, at that particular church, you know what they made us do? Just, they made all of us pastors sit up on the stage. It was like we'd be sitting right here. And I just felt terrible. I felt like oppressed and depressed. And, and they're up there singing, you know, some song. And I'm going, <laughs> you know, doing my thing. But I felt lousy. I felt like, like the world was coming to an end for me. And, and so I made it through church, you know, by the grace of God. And, and um, yeah, don't you just love hearing that? I don't feel like that today, don't worry. But, but, but that's how I felt. So we went home that night, Dana and I did, and we did something that was life-changing for us, for me, you know, especially for me at that point. Is, you know, we prayed that night. I remember we, we sat up, you know, in our bedroom and we prayed. And, and when we got done praying all we needed to pray, we got out a notebook. And... And I'm sure Dana did the writing because we can read her writing after she writes it. And, and, uh, but we wrote page after page of everything I felt like we needed from where we were at in life. Now, I'm not giving you a magic formula. What I'm telling you this is you pour your heart out to God. What I'm telling you is this is God says, I care about you. Cast your cares on me. And the way that looked for us at that time, and me in particular, is we wrote out everything that we needed. I'll give you an example. I mean, we just moved back from Haiti. We're, you know, I'm going through this identity crisis. I'm no longer the missionary Paul, you know. I'm, I'm, who am I, you know? But, but I, we were living with my parents. And, and to me, that was just like, oh, goodness. I moved out when I was 18, and here I was moved back in with my parents, and they were so gracious to us, but yet as a new, you know, couple and family, I thought, oh, it was just knocking me down, and, you know, we didn't have any furniture. We didn't have a place to stay of our own. We didn't have furniture. We didn't have, so we, writing these things down, we went through every room. Well, we need a bedroom set. 
you know, dresser, this kind of stuff. And you move into the living room and, and, you know, you need a couch and a chair that people can sit on if they come over and, you know, and maybe a TV. We went so far and we even listed the, the wastebaskets we'd need in every room because Dana was helping me and she gets down to details. And, and, uh, and, and, and we even, we just stretched ourselves way out there and we said, wow. You know, well, it's just while we're at it, you know, it was building my faith as I was writing these things down or giving them to Dana to write down. I said, let's believe God for a computer. And you'd laugh at me thinking, oh, you didn't have a computer? This was the 80s. This was the early, mid-80s, you know? And, and that was like George Jetson from the cartoon series, you know, having a computer in your house. But I said, let's, let's have a computer, Dana. And, 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 and you know, it was amazing is as we unloaded this stuff onto God, what was amazing is that it, it, it freed me up. I got rid of the care. And what was really amazing is as we got it off of me and over onto God, it was just like a whirlwind how it happened. Just boom, 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 boom. It was just one thing after another. Things that I thought were going to take 10 years in my mind to come about. Just boom, boom, boom. It, I think the whole thing was done in six months. I'm telling you, the next week, we got a call from a guy. This was like the starting of it. We got a call from a guy who was a friend of ours, you know, and, and um, he says, Paul, he says, you know, uh, I've got a situation. I says, okay, what's that? He says, well, we, we've got an opportunity to live in this house for a year where these people are going to be in Europe or something like that. But the problem is, is I've got a lease on an apartment and he says, and all our furniture is in that apartment. He says, do you think you guys could take over our lease for the year and live in our apartment? And he says, I'll tell you what, if you guys got furniture, we'll move things out as you have it, and we'll put it in the garage of this place we're staying. And I'm telling you, the, the, the rent in this place was so cheap. It was just like, I could even afford it. And, and, and we had to caretake for like 10 people, so it was a real minimal thing that I even, I could do it. And, and it was just boom, and it's like, wow, we did that. And we got in there, and it was like jobs opened up, you know, we got jobs, and, and just one by one, God just went down the list to the point where, you know, like I say, like six months later, we came across that list, and we were blown away. We were blown away how God had just, just strategically took right down the line. And, and, and met our needs. Thank you for listening to Liberty Christian Center's podcast. To partner with this ministry or for any additional information, please visit libertychristiancenter.org.